Hello everyone. So welcome to IIT and Gate classes. So today we we are going to see the gas dynamics uh, lecture series on uh, oblique shock waves. So in the last session uh, we have seen the relationship and the governing equations for oblique shock waves. In today's uh, session we are going to see the theta beta mass relations and few problems from the previous year gate. So myself, Akshay. So let us start uh, this session. So before moving on to the theta beta mass relation, so I have a, a interesting question over here. So we have seen uh, in a normal shock uh, analysis. So if I give the upstream condition, so I can calculate all the parameters in the downstream. So like if I give mass number in the upstream, so I can get all the parameters in the downstream. So I can uniquely fix the normal shock system using single parameter. So is it applicable for oblique shock wave? So the question is on how many parameters the properties across the oblique shock wave depend. So we kind of answered in the last session. So for an oblique shock system, we need at least two parameters to fix it uniquely. Right. So if I give just an upstream Mach number, it's not sufficient to say. So what is the properties across the oblique shock wave? Whereas, uh, or in fact, a normal shock wave is also a special case of an oblique shock wave that we are going to see. Like we can say uh, wave angle beta is 90 degrees. So that's a special parameter. So that that we are going to see because we are seeing properties across an oblique shock wave depends on normal component of the shock wave, uh, normal component of the upstream Mach number or velocity to with respect to the shock, shock wave, right? So I can define MN1 equal to M1 sine beta, right? So I should know what is upstream Mach number as well as beta to calculate MN1. Once I know what is MN1, I can easily calculate the property change across the shock wave, right? So this actually comes to a point there, how the shock strength can be uh, defined or how much property change happens across an oblique shock wave. Because now we have two different parameters on which MN1 depends. So if M1 constantly increases keeping beta same or if beta changes keeping M1 same, depending on that combination M1 and sine beta, we actually see a value of MN1 that actually defines the shock strength, right? So that part we are actually going to see. So if you look at this uh, system very carefully, we can see or we can define tan beta as u1 divided by w1. This is again w1, right? Similarly, this angle that is beta minus theta from this triangle u2, w2 and v2. So I can define tan of beta minus theta as u2 divided by w2. So now if I use this idea, right, and the momentum equation, what is momentum equation? We obtained that momentum equation for oblique shock system is rho1 u1 is equal to rho2 u2. Also, we have seen from the geometry that tan of beta minus theta is equal to u2 by W2. Similarly, tan beta is equal to U1 by W1. So now if I do this uh, uh, using the continuity balance, so what I can uh, show here is like rho1 by rho2, this is equal to U2 by U1. 
also from these two equation tan beta minus theta divided by tan beta so if i divide those two equation what i get is tan of beta minus theta divided by tan beta equal to u2 by w2 multiplying w1 by u1 so and from the momentum balance in the tangential direction we obtained or arrived at a result stating that tangential component of velocity across the oblique shock wave does not change so that is w1 is equal to w2 so i can cancel these two so i actually get which is equal to u2 by u1 that's what i am having over here u2 by u1 which is also equal to rho1 by rho2 with the help of continuity equation so and from the normal shock relation we have found that rho2 by rho1 is a function of upstream mach number so in the oblique shock system which is a function of tangent sorry normal component of the upstream mach number so that is nothing but m1 sin beta so i am just using rho2 by rho1 as a function of normal component of the mach number so that's what i am using from the normal shock relation with the help of normal component of the upstream mach number so that's what i am substituting over here this equation we are already familiar with so i am not going into the details of how we arrived this uh, arrived at this particular relation right so now you see here i have tan beta minus theta divided by tan beta is equal to function of mach number beta and gamma fine so now i can use the trigonometric relation that is tan of a minus b as tan a minus tan b divided by 1 plus tan a tan b form and with the help of some algebraic uh, simplification so i can actually uniquely define tan theta as beta and m1 so this is left as an exercise so i have given you the hint so you have to use tan of a minus b form from the trigonometric relations and you can perform the uh, algebraic simplification so you should be able to get this particular form right so now you see here if i can explicitly define theta as beta and m so that means i can actually draw a graph right so by keeping m1 same and for different values of beta what would be my tan uh, theta or by fixing the beta and uh, varying different values of m and what would be values of theta so th those things we can actually do now so if i do that what i actually get so i get a curve like this you see here so here for an illustrative purpose i am using mach number 2 for this if i draw the plot between beta versus theta by fixing mach is equal to 2 so i get a curve like this you see here there are two points at which this curve closes or ends right what are these two points one is 90 degree that is a maximum possible wave angle for a given mass number m2 right so that means like say i have a deflection angle theta which is varying in this direction and wave angle beta varying in this direction so one of the upstream for this one is beta come going to 90 degree one of the extreme is. so in this scenario i have theta is 0 right theta 0 and the other condition still theta is 0 and the lowest possible angle for beta is going to be in this case is 30 degree what is this 30 degree so that that means it is a mach angle so when beta becomes a mach angle so we already seen mach angle can be read, um, defined as 
sine inverse of 1 over mass number right so in this case it's the upstream mass number m1 right so for mass number 2 it's an obvious sine inverse of 1 by 2 is 30 degree right so for mass 2 which varies from 30 to 90 degree so what happens if i increase the mass number right now i am drawing for two different mass numbers as parameters and again drawing the uh, plot between beta versus theta see i increase mass number from 2 to 3 and if i increase to a further value like 2 3 4 5 so you see so similarly if i increase to a higher value it, it goes like that now i have a question for you so if i if i increase my upstream mass number say m1 tending to infinity does it curve also tends to infinity the the deflection angle also tends to an infinity or to some uh, value that's an interesting question so uh, i will leave it as an exercise but you can again do the similar analysis what we have done uh, during normal shock relations we have found the limiting cases as m1 tends to infinity what happens to a different uh, parameters like p2 by p1 rho 2 by rho 1 t2 by t1 and uh, m2 so behind shock like those things at the limit of infinity so similarly you can do that one and you should be able to find theta tends to a finite value of theta max which is uh, which is again a function of the type of uh, gas we are using so say for air we have gamma is 1.4 so this theta max goes to around 45.3 degrees so if i remember it uh, correctly So theta mass uh, goes to around 45.3 degree. Okay. So that that depends actually depends on the type of the gas we are using as m1 tends to infinity theta mass. Okay. 45.3. Fine. So the thing here is like for every given upstream mass number, you can see there is a limit beyond which. The, the deflection angle whatever we have will yield no solution to oblique shock system right so every every system so you see for mark number two or mark number three or to mark number ten whatever you see so for every system i have a maximum permissible deflection angle for which a straight oblique shock solutions are exist right beyond which there is no solution to oblique shock what happens to this system so if, if i have uh say like a 2d wedge kind of thing which is theta which is greater than theta max for a given upstream mass number m1 right so what happens to those systems so in those systems what happens the oblique shock detaches from the body and becomes like a detached shock wave which kind of looks like bow shock wave that that brings in a different physics than what we have studied so far let me um just just uh, briefly introduce uh, what happens in these scenarios say like if, if there is a bow shock which sits in front of the body then what happens in the bow shock system unlike oblique shock wave so i have the property change across the system is similar like if i have p1 over here and p2 over here so irrespective of the different streamline which is passing through this shock system so every system experiences the c 
similar property change. So P1 and P2 are same. Like that means like P2 by P1 for given upstream Mach number is going to be constant in an oblique shock system. But whereas for the bow shock system, what happens? The shock strength itself varies from this point to this point. So it, it basically becomes a solution corresponding to beta is 90 degree at the leading edge or at the near to the nose of the body to beta becoming Mach angle at a far uh, from the nose of the body, right? So in, in this system, what happens? The shock strength actually varies. So that means a different streamline passing through a bow shock system at different locations will experience the different deflection angle beta. So that means what exactly happening now is like this P2 by P1 is no more a constant for a different streamline. So that actually brings in a different physics because P1 is same, that is an upstream condition, it is not changing. Only P2 is actually varying as function of say in the y direction. So that means I have a different pressure in different y locations that that actually brings in a boroclinic torque. That means that the, the difference in pressure will bring in the rotationality to the flow. So that's a very unique uh, a situation. Even in an inviscid irrotational flow field, what we have seen in the beginning, like what we have assumed, but a baroclinic torque, which can induce a rotationality to inviscid flow. That is very interesting. So we are not having any viscous effect but still we are going to get the rotationality to the flow. So this, this is a, one of the good examples where we can actually generate a vorticity in an inviscid um, a platform. So yeah, so that, that's what happens in the Boshock system. So we are not going into the details of the Boshock because it is not exactly there in the syllabus, but it is an interesting uh, fact to know. Right. Okay. So now uh, we will uh, come back to our the discussion of bow shock. Uh, sorry, uh, discussion of oblique shock system. So, as I said earlier, so for every upstream Mach number, I can have one um, um, condition beyond which I cannot have oblique shock solution. So that is uh, defined by theta max. So if I join all the locus of points which for all Mach numbers, which passes through this theta is equal to theta max, I can call it as theta is equal to theta max line. And now you see carefully, if I, if I draw at any deflection angle, right, theta is constant line. constant line. You see, it intersects this line at two different locations. Right? So, this is a kind of uh, a dilemma, right? Which point, which deflection angle does this solution actually uh, existing for? So, that's the question we have to address now. Whether uh, this wave angle or this wave angle. Right, it's very interesting. So to address that one, so what we do is like we divide this particular system in uh, two categories. One is, so we actually draw one solid line over here. This corresponding to, this corresponding to sonic condition. That means M2 becomes one for given upstream Mach number the condition for beta at which M2 is actually becoming one sonic condition. So above which we actually call it as strong shock solution, below which we call it as a weak shock solution. That means strong shock solution, we define it as a strong shock solution because my shock strength that is P2 by P1, if I calculate with this beta will be higher compared to P2 by P1, if I calculate with weak shock solution, that is with this beta. 
because you see m n 1 we define it as m 1 sin beta right for in both the scenarios for this theta i have m 1 fixed that is upstream mass number so we are analyzing on the same m 1 curve right but if sin beta increases my m n 1 also increases that means t 2 by p 1 corresponding to that one also increases so that is why we are calling this part as a strong shock solution this part as a weak shock solution and one more thing the point above which will have m2 which is less than 1 for points below which i will be having m2 which is greater than 1 that means the downstream mark number will be supersonic and upstream mark number sorry downstream mark number for a strong shock solution will be subsonic. This can either be supersonic or subsonic. So, it, it actually depends, right? So, it, it actually depends. Uh, only uh, there is a small region in between where I can still have a subsonic, uh, sorry, a subsonic solution even with the weak shock solution. So, that is fine. But in general, the downstream Mach number in the weak shock solution will be almost always the a supersonic exceptional is near theta max uh, location other than that like everywhere uh, we will be seeing a supersonic uh, mass number behind the oblique shock wave in weak shock solution whereas for strong shock solution it is always going to be less than one that means it is always going to be subsonic behind the shock wave that's that's uh, one one more important point okay so now we will move on to address like what happens um with by keeping one of the parameters fixed and uh, allowing other two parameters to vary freely so th this is this is the uh, combined graph i am having over here with wave angle in the x direction and uh, deflection angle theta in the y direction so you see again, so I have this dashed line corresponding to theta is equal to theta max and this solid line corresponding to downstream mass number coming to sonic condition for given upstream mass number M1, right? So this is how the mass number is varying, increasing. So right to this one is a weak shock solution the left to this one is a strong shock solution. Okay. So now, see, we will analyze uh, this uh, much more carefully. So keeping theta constant and varying Mach number, upstream Mach number, okay, how this graph looks like. If M increases, you see in the weak shock limit, in the weak shock limit, beta starts to decrease, right? But in the sh sh strong shock limit, if I extend this line like this, if I increase the Mach number, that also means that beta also increasing. So that means in weak shock limit or yeah, weak shock limit, beta decreases as upstream Mach number increases keeping theta constant. Similarly, in the strong shock system, beta increases as upstream Mach number increases at constant deflection angle theta, right? So this uh, can be seen here in this uh, uh, given figure. So I have two wedge in which I'm keeping the wedge angle theta is uh, same 20 degree. So for which I can find for Mach number 2, the beta comes out to be 53.3 degrees, whereas for Mach number 5, my beta comes out to be 29.9 degrees. That means the beta decrease. In which region uh, we are in? We are in weak shock solution region. So that is why beta is decreasing. And you also have to keep in mind that in nature, usually the system exists such that there will be a minimum loss uh, possible in the system. That means the minimum total pressure loss 
which can happen with weak shock solution that means the flow still remains supersonic behind the shock wave that is how nature establishes the solution but it does not mean that we cannot have a strong shock solution system we can have a strong shock solution system for which like we can actually create a shock, strong shock solution system by keeping the pressure ratio that means like p2 by p1 which is required to generate that particular solution so if i keep this one i can still have a strong shock solution system but if it is a freely established a uh, shock system in nature the usual scenario will be a weak shock solution that is why we usually treat unless and until it is specified in the problem we can take it as granted like we are analyzing the system in weak shock solution limit okay so that we can keep in mind one more interesting point you you should observe here though the beta is decreased right beta is decreased in this system only m1 is increased theta is same beta is decreased look at the value of m n1 i have here so compared to this system the normal component of the mach number is higher in the second system though beta is decreasing because mn1 is defined as m1 sin beta though the beta is decreased but the increase in m1 is higher compared to the decrease in beta so that is why i am saying which actually depends on two parameters m1 as well as beta so the combination of these two will give you the strength of the shock you, you see here here i have the pressure rise only 2.82 times the upstream pressure whereas in this system the pressure rise is almost seven times the upstream pressure so that means like the the strength of the shock is much much higher compared to this shock strength right so always you have to remember m1 as well as beta will the combination of those two will define the strength of the shock all right so now if i analyze the system in uh, uh, the uh, in the other direction say like i have a mach number which is fixed i am not varying okay but i am varying the deflection angle theta say i have two different uh, system or wedge right theta so i am increasing theta from this wedge to this wedge so i am increasing theta by keeping same upstream mach number same system m1 and m1 are same in both the system so what happens now so again you look at this particular graph for m is equal to 2 that is fixed and increase the theta from say like some 10 degree to 20 degree so what's happening now by increasing theta my wave angle is actually increasing right so here i have some wave angle so here you see i have a different wave angle so this wave angle is actually increased by increasing theta at constant upstream mach number right that that is also illustrated in this wedge uh, system 2d wedge system where i have theta is equal to 10 degree for upstream mach number of 2 and theta is 20 degree for upstream mach number of 2 so you see in this scenario beta was 39.2 degrees in this scenario i got beta as 53 degree beta increased also see about the normal component of velocity what's happening so because m1 is fixed so my mn1 which is also equal to m1 sin beta so because m1 is fixed now it is not varying but beta is increasing so that also implies that mn1 also increasing so that means the strength of the shock is increased from this system to this system that means by increasing theta at constant m the strength of the shock also increased within the weak shock limit right so this this is going to be a different if you analyze the similar system in the strong shock limit so that that also you can see in that case the beta actually decreases right so that the, in that case the shock strength actually decreases so but 
as far as this uh, session is concerned, I am not going to analyze anything in the strong shock limit. We will be keeping ourselves to weak shock limit. Okay. So now we understood theta, beta, and Mach relations and the governing equations for the oblique shock system and how the property change across the oblique shock systems can be analyzed. So now we are at position to take up a few problems from the previous year um, gate. So what I'm doing here is, so for an illustrative purpose, so I'm taking two of the uh, previous year gate questions. One of them is like theoretical, the other one is a numerical. So this one was asked in gate 2021. So they are asking which of the following statement or statements is or are true across an oblique shock. They are also given which is uh, adiabatic condition over a wedge which is shown in the below figure. See, I have a wedge that is a 2D body and I have an oblique shock wave which is formed with upstream mass number which is 2 per sign. So if this is the system given to you, what are the things you can actually observe and which is actually true from the given set of statements. So in option A, they are saying total pressure decreases. This is obvious, right? Like we are going to experience the loss across the shock wave, which is quantified using the total pressure loss. So the total pressure actually decreases. That is true statement. They are also asking you to tick the true statement. Mach number based on velocity tangential to the shock decreases, which is very, very interesting uh, statement. From our tangential component of momentum equation, we obtained or, uh, or arrived at a result that is W1 is equal to W2. Tangential component of the velocities are same. Does it necessarily mean that like tangential component of Mach number is also same, which is defined based on tangential component of velocity? That's the question we have to ask now. How, how do we define the tangential component of Mach number? Mt1, which is defined as W1 divided by root of gamma r t1, speed of sum. Similarly, Mt2 is defined as W2 divided by root of gamma r t2. So if I take the ratio of these two, Mt2 divided by Mt1, So that means like I know W1 and W2 are same from the momentum balance. We are already arrived at this conclusion. So this actually gives you gamma R and gamma R we can cancel out because of the same uh, uh, gas we are using for the analysis. So we don't have to worry for that one. So now it actually depends on root T1 divided by root T2. So we know across the oblique shock wave, the to static temperature increases, right? T2 by T1 is greater than 1. So T2 will be higher than T1. So if T2 is higher than T1, so that means Mt2 will be less than Mt1. Mt2 is less than Mt1. So that means the Mach number, which is defined based on the tangential component of velocity, does not remain same. So which actually decreases. Mt2 is less than Mt1. So this statement is actually true, right? So very important observation. Total temperature remains constant. So again, from energy balance, we have arrived at a solution condition that H01 is equal to H02. That implies for a calorically perfect gas, Cp, C01 is equal to Cp, C02. So I can calculate, uh, cancel out Cp from both the sides for calorically perfect gas. Yeah, so that gives you T01 is equal to T02. So total temperature remains constant. That is also a true statement. The option D that says Mach number based on velocity tangential to the shock remains the same and that based on the velocity normal to the shock decreases, which is wrong, right? Which is not going to remain same. So we already ticked this option B, so that clearly uh, we saw that which decreases. So this statement is wrong. So for this question, option A, B, and C are the right option. This uh, this uh, 
question uh, was asked as a multiple selection question. Okay. Now we will move on to the next question. An oblique shock is inclined at an angle of 35 degrees to the upstream flow of velocity 517.56 meter per second. The deflection of the flow due to the this shock is 5.75 degrees and the temperature downstream is 182.46 Kelvin. Assume the gas constant R is equal to 287 joules per kg Kelvin. Specific heat ratio gamma is 1.4 and specific heat at constant pressure Cp is equal to 1005 joules per kg Kelvin. Using the conservation relations, the Mach number of the upstream flow can be obtained as so they are also given you the hint to go forward for this question. You can go in a different directions if you want. So uh, as I always say that like in gas dynamics, as long as you are applying the theory correct, so you can approach the same problem from a different direction. So it, it is possible in uh, especially in gas dynamics. So it is not actually fixed at one particular way to arrive at a solution. But we will see uh, from their perspective, they have asked or given a hint that with the conservation relation, we can actually obtain this uh, upstream mass number. Okay. So first thing, we are going to draw the given system. So first, we have to get the given information correctly. Say like how I have oblique shock. Like this. And I have an upstream flow which is coming like this and deflecting like this with the deflection angle theta. Right, so this is my m1 and velocity corresponding is v1. And if I draw the normal component and the tangential component to this system, then what I get is this is my normal component mn1 with velocity u1 and tangential component mt1 corresponding velocity w1. Similarly, in this system, I have mn2 with a corresponding velocity u2 and this is mt2 corresponding velocity w2. component and uh, what we have here is downstream condition m2 and v2. Okay, this is the system at hand and the deflection angle is beta with respect to the upstream flow direction which is beta. So that means this is also beta and this is going to be beta minus beta. Okay, so now the system is clear to us. So from the given figure, you see, I can actually calculate u1 directly, right? Because in the question, they are given what is v1. So let us also write what is given in the question. V1 is given as 517.7, sorry, 517.56 meter per second. And uh, beta is given to be 35 degrees. And deflection angle theta is given as 5.75 degree. And uh, downstream temperature T2 is given 
as 182.46 Kelvin. So if you get this kind of information, you should be able to get the sense of like what kind of uh, approach you should go with. And other things they are given is the gas properties like CP. As for air, they are given, though they might not have mentioned it. Joules per kg Kelvin. And uh, gamma is 1.4 and R is 287 joules per kg Kelvin. So this is given in the problem. Okay, now we can actually calculate the upstream normal component. So that is U1 equal to V1 sine beta, right? Because if you look at the velocity triangle, so I can write sine beta as opposite to hypotenuse. So that is u1 by v1. So I can calculate u1 is equal to v1 sine beta. Similarly, if I have to calculate what is u2, that is going to be v2 sine of beta minus theta or else I can also write in terms of W2 tan of beta minus, this is also possible to write, right? So this one also I can write W1 tan beta. And from the geometry, we already know that I can write tan of beta minus theta divided by tan beta as U2 by U1, which is also equal to, sorry, which is also equal to rho 1 by rho 2. So the one of the approach is like you can use the relation between rho 2 by rho 1 as function of Mach number and beta and you can go on to calculate for uh, u1 or uh, u2, right? So that is one of the way to calculate because you get this as function of beta and m1. So beta is already known. So you are only unknown in this part is m1. You know what is beta, what is theta, and what is beta. So you get this ratio straight forward. You can relate it to this one to calculate M1. That is one of the approach. So where you have to do uh, some of the algebraic simplification to get the M1, right? So one unknown, one equation. You can easily solve. But we are going uh, taking the other approach as uh, uh, given in the problem. So they are given as a hint. So what I am going to do now is so these are the things we can easily calculate from the given system. So what I'm doing is like, first I'm calculating U1 as V1 sine beta. So I get V1 is 517.56 times sine of beta is 35 degrees. So if I calculate that one, I get U1 is equal to 296.86 meter per second. And then I am going to calculate U2 using this relation tan beta minus theta by tan beta, which is also equal to U2 by U1. So I know what is U1. So I calculate U2. So I get U2 to be equal to 237.43 meter per second. So now what I'm going to do, because I have to calculate M2 and they are given the temperature downstream. So we should immediately get this click, what we can do with this uh, temperature, the information, right? Means like I can somehow relate it to energy equation, right? So we also arrived at an uh, energy equation for oblique shock system as H1 plus U1 square divided by 2, which is equal to H2 plus u2 square divided by 2. So we shown that like the energy change across the oblique shock wave also depends on normal component of velocity. So we got what is u1, we got what is u2, and we know what is t2. So I can easily calculate h2. So if I want to calculate h1, 
So this is going to be H2 plus U2 square minus U1 square divided by 2. Right? So now I can calculate what is H1. So what is H2? That is Cp times T2. That is T2 is given in the question. So Cp is also given. So you can use U2 square minus U1 square divided by 2. So this is equal to Cp T1. So from here I can calculate T1 which is equal to T2 plus U2 square minus U1 square divided by 2 Cp. Whenever you do these kind of problems, try to simplify the equation as uh, simple as possible so that like you have to put less number of inputs in the virtual calculator. It, it helps uh, to save you time. So do most of the part in an algebraic uh, simplification, then uh, put the numericals at the end, numbers at the end. Right? So now I get from here T1 as 166.66 Kelvin. You see, I have T2, which is given in the question, that is 182, and T1, it is 166. So there is not much jump in the temperature, so around uh, 18 degrees or so, like uh, 16 degrees or so, which is actually changed. So that means like, I'm going to expect an upstream mass number, which is not that high, slightly supersonic. So that, that's, that's what we, we might expect. So that, that's one of the way to cross check whether you are getting the right numbers or not. As long as you are doing it correct, so it doesn't matter. Right? So now how we can calculate upstream mass number. So M1 can be calculated as, I know what is V1 the velocity, upstream velocity, divided by speed of sound in the upstream, at the upstream, so gamma r t1. So if you use that one, v1 is 517.56 and t1 is 166.66 that we calculated, gamma is 1.4, r is 287 joules per kg Kelvin given in the question. So we get approximately 2.00 as the solution, right? So they are asked you to put or round off to one decimal places. So you can round off to 2.0. Okay, so that concludes our discussion on oblique shock relations. So thank you for uh, listening. And uh, you can feel free to contact us on IIT gate classes. Thank you.